Thank you so much. What a joy it is to be here. We've enjoyed being here in Alabama, uh, visiting John and Laura. Thank you for your faithfulness on this weekend after Thanksgiving. And I'm glad you're here. And again, I, we've just enjoyed it so much. Enjoyed the service this morning. Enjoyed hearing Pastor Toll uh, preach and uh, thoroughly enjoyed that. I, I, don't, I wanna, just want to get the record straight here from the beginning. I, as soon as you got up and you've heard my voice, I don't want anybody to worry. I'm not on those CDs, all right? So I don't want you to worry. Uh, I could tell you're already fretting, and so uh, I'm not. Don't worry. I, I really, I, I'm, I'm still convinced I do definitely have the gift of music, but nobody wants to recognize that, and uh, that's okay. And uh, where's Brother Jason? Brother Jason, where you at, brother? Played the piano for him. He's, yeah, yeah, okay, still awake. Good, all right. I didn't know, of course, I know he and Brother John, my son John, have gotten real close, and I thought all this time I've been calling him Jason Phelps. I thought maybe he was related to Michael, you know, the swimmer Phelps or something. I thought it was a connection. And finally, you know, sometimes your children don't want to tell you, Dad, you're not saying something right, you know, or you got something hanging from your nose or something like that. And they just, they just don't want to tell you. And, uh, but so I have to apologize. It's felt. I want to make sure I get it right because I want you to, you're a great man. I want you to, okay, good. All right, we're all right, good. All right, thank you, sir, for playing for him. You did a great job. And I love seeing my children serve the Lord, don't you? And seeing your children, your parents, serve the Lord with their lives, and that's a blessing. We give God all the glory. And um, young people can still give their hearts and their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we believe that, and God's been good to us. So please stop by and see us, and uh, that would be a blessing. We'd love to visit with you. I, th I think of this, you know, the Bible says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And some of you may wonder, can any good thing come out of New England? Well, it just so happens, just so happens, just shaking hands, like we're all supposed to fellowship, shaking hands. I met this dear brother over here. He's from Rhode Island. Now, how many of y'all knew that already in the church? How many of you know where Rhode Island is? Just be honest, all right? We're in church, all right? Good, all right? That's what he's, unless he was lying to me, just, you know, to connect, you know, you got to put a little fudge in there, you know, but I, I think he was telling the truth. You're from Rhode Island. So, and this looks like a good man over here and not asleep yet, amen? He's still awake in church. And so, uh, who else is from New England? Who, anybody else from New England? Or, see, there, there's a few here. Revival can happen in this church, amen? Praise the Lord. Good. There's a brother right there. Good. All right. We're, we're in New Hampshire. Yeah, that's right. We even say amen every five minutes or ten or so, but we are in New Hampshire. God's been good to us. Let me just tell you, I'm definitely re I'm ready to get into the message. I've got a truth that the Lord has convicted my heart about that I'm looking forward to sharing with you. Hope it'll be a blessing to you. But um, let me just ask you, can I put up just a quick plug in for you to continue to pray for New England? There's no doubt about it. Um, <clears throat> anything that's done, God does it. But I will tell you tonight, there is a stirring in New England. There's a stirring, and um, take it to the bank. There's so much more that God wants to do everywhere, but there is a stirring. God is working, and there's churches being planted. Right now, just about three weeks ago, a church was planted in uh, Dedham, New Han Dedham, Massachusetts. It's one of the suburbs of Boston. A couple months ago, a church was planted in Quincy, Massachusetts. Brother Ian Brown started a church in Quincy. How many of you have ever heard of Quincy, Massachusetts? Now, here's the reason why you need to know the name of that city, because that's where Dunkin' Donuts was founded, amen? How many of you know about, I know you don't have one close here, I know, and again, we need those, all right? But uh, Quincy, Massachusetts, church was just planted there. There's a church in Rhode Island, my son Joshua, for the past five weeks has been helping him during the week. A church in Rhode Island, is just telling this dear brother about this before, uh, during the handshaking time, but there's a church in Coventry, Rhode Island, right now, right now, is starting two churches in Rhode Island at the same time. They're starting a church in Portsmouth, Rhode Island, and Providence, Rhode Island. And right now, they're starting them. They started a couple months ago, and they just had gospel meetings for four weeks straight, every night, preaching services in all three locations, the, 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 the main church and two different locations. And they're starting two churches in those cities. And, um, and so the Lord put in our hearts, just tell you this real quick, the Lord put in our hearts in the 40s, as I was telling your preacher, uh, what I thought I was going to do in the, my 20s. Uh, I've been in the ministry for since our time in college, a pastor in North Carolina. The Lord led us back up to the Northeast, and then God put in our hearts in our mid-40s uh, to start a church, and that's what we did, and God's been good to us, and we praise the Lord for that. So pray for New England. Pray uh, that God will continue to work. We all understand that's where it started here in our country, do we not? And uh, it's stony ground. Uh, we go soul winning. We go soul winning because it's right. But I'll just tell you, I pastored North Carolina. There's a big difference between going door knocking in North Carolina than there is in New, in New Hampshire. And, but you just keep going. You just keep going because it's right. And it pleases the Lord. And um, you just keep sowing the seed. 
And of course, we look for opportunities everywhere we go to sow the seed. And so God has been good and um, we praise the Lord for his goodness. If I can just do this real quick and then we're going to get right into the word of God. I'd like to introduce my wife. She's not going to be real happy about this, but sweetheart, if you'll stand just for a moment. My wife, Teresa, and we've been married for 26 years and God's been good to us. And we have our four boys, our daughter-in-law, and our first grandchild. So my wife is a grandma. And you say, what does that make you? That makes me none of your business. And, uh, but uh, no, I'm a grandpa too. And uh, we're kind of liking it. It's pretty good. I just bought, I, I told my wife she was shopping for a Christmas and birthday gift for Stephen. He'll be one here in a couple weeks. And she said she called me, her and Josh were at a store uh, the beginning of this week when we were still at home. She said, I want to get this, this, or this. I said, just get the loudest toys. I don't care what it is, the ones that make the most noise. And I want to torture my son like my mother-in-law and my parents tortured us when they gave us loud toys for our children to enjoy. And so we got Stephen some loud toys. And so we're just real thankful for that. Amen. And, and, and I'm thankful that uh, and loud cho toys are usually cheaper too. So praise the Lord, just as long as they make noise. Amen. I got to tell you this real quick, too. I, I, I guarantee I really do. I got, I got a sermon cooking on the stove here. I'm really fired up. I don't, I don't know. I don't remember this, but Brother Henry Oates telling me the story. When he was in college, of course, he was in the church I was in when, when he was a teenager. And he started, uh, he started uh, dating uh, who he's married to now. And I, I, I can't believe this happened, but he said it did. So you can talk to him after the service. But he said he started dating the, uh, who he's married to. And he said... I sent him a letter in the mail, and I, I, I sent him a note, and I said, I want you to take her out to eat. And he said I put a food stamp in that letter. Now, he said that. I didn't get, is that true? Did I really, I trust his wife. I don't trust him. Okay. Wow, really? Man, it's probably the last one I had. That was a big sacrifice. And uh, I can't believe, it. I'm absolutely torn out of the frame of that story. And, and uh, I never want to give up my food stamps, amen. All right. 1 Samuel chapter 14, please. Let's stand together. Can you stand with me just for a moment as we read a few verses from the Word of God? 1 Samuel chapter 14. I cannot tell you how honored I am, uh, really, to be here. Uh, I will tell you this quick, because I, I don't want you to stand too long here, but I want to echo what your preacher said. I, one, of my, one of the delights I've had in the ministry, I worked at a Bible college for almost uh, nine, almost ten years, and one of the joys I had was going to different churches and bringing music groups each summer. One of the joys I had was to going to churches um, and, and seeing what God was doing in different churches, and in particular, guys that we went to college with. And what a joy it was to see preachers that were being faithful and serving the Lord and sticking, you know, staying in the trenches. And, and, um, and so my heart's just been warmed just by the fellowship with your pastor. You have a faithful man of God. I don't need to convince you of that. But he's faithful. And, um, you know, I heard Dr. Don Sisk say a couple of years ago at a missions conference, he said, God's never called us to be successful. He's called us to be faithful. I want you to think about that for a minute. Now, if God makes us successful, of course, we see Joshua 1.8 tells us there's a formula for success if we'll live in the Word of God, meditate in God's Word. I'll probably say this in the message, but we've, we've got to really ask the Lord to help us with our thinking. We're too, this will absolutely, I hope it doesn't rattle your cage on a Sunday night. But we're, we're, we're probably too success-driven. We're probably not enough faithfulness-driven. That's just my little opinion there. Y'all pray for me, amen? And um, you say, don't you want to be a success? I do, but as I get older and older and as I keep serving the Lord, I, I truly do. I hunger in my heart to be more faithful. And I have to confess, you also find that my faith can waver so quickly, just like the disciples. Aren't you amazed how patient the Lord Jesus Christ was with the disciples? I mean, he's trying to prepare them for ministry for him. And just like that, something happened. You know, we, we looked at the children of Israel and they complained. And the disciples are guilty of that. And let's look in the Bible and realize that, and then we look at our own lives and we're guilty of that, guilty of that sometimes too. We have an amazing story here in the Bible. First Samuel chapter 14. I love this story. It is awesome. Now it came to pass, verse 1, upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man that bare his armor, come and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side, but he told not his father. And Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migran, and the people that were with him were about 600 men. And Ahiah, the son of Ahitub, and Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, wearing an ephod, and the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. And between the passages by which Jonathan sought to go over unto the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on the one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name of the one was Bozes, and the name of the other's Senna. 
or Sine. And the forefront of the one was situate northward over against Michmash and the other southward over against Gibeah. Verse 6 is our text. I'm, I'm sure most of you know this story. It's an amazing story in the Bible. Before I read the verse, I'd have to tell you, I'd, I personally would almost put this in the category of a David and Goliath story. Probably most of you know what happened here. But in verse 6, the Bible says, And Jonathan said to the young man that bare the armor, Come, and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. Let's pray together, please. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for a wonderful day in your house. Thank you for this dear pastor. And uh, I, I enjoyed, Lord, you know, I enjoyed so much seeing him love and serve your sheep, this great church this morning from Psalm 100. And Lord, it refreshed me just to see him share a passage and encourage the church to be reminded of the goodness of the Lord and that your mercy is everlasting and your truth endureth to all generations. And that we would sing and we praise you and we worship you and we thank you. And Lord, the music, thank you for, Lord, I was sitting over here thanking you, Lord, for the orchestra. What a wonderful opportunity, Lord, to offer praise to you and service to you, Lord, in the church. Thank you for their hard work and the choir and uh, the choir director and the nursery workers, Lord, we, all the different areas people serve. But Lord, I thank you. My cup's been filled, Lord. I'm thankful to have been here and to be refreshed to see the great work here. And I'm so thrilled that my, my son and his wife my daughter-in-law are serving in this great ministry. Now, Lord, we, we come to the evening service and this gracious pastor has allowed me to stand behind this sacred desk and love and service people with him tonight. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. Holy Spirit of God, fill us, empower us as we hear your word, as we hear it and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, may be seated. Thank you for standing for just a moment. Again, it's really an amazing story in the Bible, and it, it brings me, if I can just kind of let you know kind of where we're going here uh, along the way as we study this, uh, this passage. We had a theme in our church a couple years ago in our church plant, Forward by Faith. Forward by Faith. And, and whether it's a theme, whether you don't have to have a theme, but if you've got a theme or you have something that you are, um, that you are emphasizing, uh, more often than not, you'll have the privilege to be, uh, to be tested in that area. And the truth of the matter is, is that we, we, it's good for us to just be reminded as we're going to see an incredible example of going forward by faith uh, tonight in this story. It's important for us to be reminded about how important faith has got to be in our lives on a daily basis. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, we know in the New Testament, the Bible says, whatsoever is not of faith is what? Sin. And the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, without faith it is impossible to what? Please him. So we're reminded in the Word of God as the just shall live by faith, and all, uh, it's, it's, it's threadlined, of course, all through the Bible. But, now, of course, a faith unto salvation. And can I say to you, if you don't know for sure you're going to heaven, the greatest step of faith you can take is take that step of faith and trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And I would encourage you to do that tonight if you've never done that. But obviously I'm speaking to a church family that, um, that understands that matter of that step of faith in reference to salvation. And then we get the privilege to exercise that faith on a daily basis in our lives. And yes, that word is even found in the Old Testament, and we see other words that are synonymous with it. We don't have to, we, we, we never want to, you know, we don't have to strain when something is so clear in the Bible. But, uh, but this matter of going forward by faith and exercising our faith, and, and I see an example of that. The word faith is not found necessarily in this passage, but we absolutely see a clear example of somebody going forward by faith in the story here in 1 Samuel 14. And before I get to the message, let me, um, I've got this one here. We're good, right? Awesome. Uh, let me say to you that um, I want you to notice uh, this Jonathan. You know, to me, he's, he's got to be one of the unsung heroes in the Bible. You, you ever thought about the fact that Jonathan really could have, he really could have had everything, really, as far as he could have been in line. Um, even later on, he defers to David. And I think we're familiar with the life of Jonathan. I don't know if you've ever thought about that fact where Jonathan, you know, I think Jonathan understood that wasn't, that wasn't God's calling on his life and, and uh, to one day lead to that capacity. But one thing is for sure, uh, he, he saw an opportunity. 
the Philistines had come up upon God's people, the children of Israel, and King Saul was in the saddle. Um, I used to make a statement. It's, it's funny, the older we get, we sometimes we just literally have to apologize maybe for something. Not this, of course, we're not talking about false doctrine, but statements we make. I used to say that Saul started good, but he didn't finish well. And the more I study the life of Saul, I don't think Saul even finished, uh, started good, you know. And uh, not to just knock him, but I don't think he did. I think uh, if you go to chapter 13, we're not going to go there now, but if you go back to chapter 13, yeah, we're familiar with the story of Saul and the Amalekites, and he was supposed to wipe them out, and he brought back the best, right, to, uh, to give an offering to the Lord, right? That was later on. Here, he'd already he'd messed up. Samuel already came to him. And so really what's happening here in the story in 1 Samuel chapter 14 is that uh, the Philistines are against the children of Israel and King Saul sitting under a pomegranate tree trying to figure out what he's going to do. Now I will say this to you. We do. We need those times. We have to have those times where we seek the Lord. I'm not so sure that King Saul was seeking the Lord. <laughs> but he and his 600 men, his entourage and all these people try to figure out what they're going to do. But Jonathan didn't waste no time. Jonathan said something is not right here. And the Bible says that Jonathan went, uh, went the hard route. That's not so much the message this, uh, this evening, but uh, he went the rough way. He went the hard way. His father, they, and later on they take account, they, even through this whole process, it's really an amazing story. Even through the whole process, they didn't even know he was gone. They take account later on, they find that there's two people missing, or Jonathan was gone, because God had called him to do something, and Jonathan said, this is not right. We need to go up against these guys. That is amazing to me. And again, we we're familiar with the David and Goliath, the, the tallest of them and the giant. Nobody go up against them. We're talking about an army of men. And Jonathan said, we're going to go up and we're going to get it. And it really is an amazing story. It's a great step of faith, a story of faith where Jonathan, he went that hard route and uh, he went forward. I want you to, we read verse 6. Let me pick it up so you get a little more of the context here in getting into the message. In verse 7, the Bible said, And his armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart. Turn thee. Behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. And can I say to you this evening that when you and I go forward by faith, sometimes we don't, and I'm, I'm, I'm fixing to get to the message. It's one of those where it's going to be a little while to get the plane in the air, okay? And we'll be up there for a little while. It might get a little rough for a little bit. We're going to hopefully land smooth. Y'all okay with that? All right, good, all right? But uh, we... Uh, uh, let me say to you that when you step out by faith, sometimes you don't really know who's going to catch it. But there will be somebody, and in this case, there was an armor bearer who said, man, he really believes in this thing. And understand that Jonathan didn't have confidence in himself. Jonathan had a great confidence in the Lord. And so Jonathan said, we're getting after it. And the armor bearer said, listen, whatever's in your heart, let's just do it. I'm with you on this thing. It's really an amazing story. Then said Jonathan in verse 8, Behold, we will pass over unto these men, and we will discover ourselves unto them. If they say thus unto us, tarry until we come uh, to you, then we will stand still in our place and will not go up unto them. But if they say thus, come up unto us, then we will go up. For the Lord hath delivered them into our hand, and this shall be a sign unto us. Look at verse 11. And both of them discovered themselves unto the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Behold, the Hebrews came forth out of the holes where they had hid themselves. And the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us and we will show you a thing. Aren't some things funny in the Bible? <laughs> Come up here, we're going to show you a thing. <laughs> you know, I, I thought it was funny. And Jonathan said unto his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. And Jonathan climbed up upon his hands and upon his knees, and his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan, and his armor bearer slew after him. And that first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within, as it were, a half acre of land which a yoke of oxen might plow. And we'll stop the reading at that point, but it is an amazing story in the Bible. This initial victory, and then later on, how much more God does and uh, it's an incredible story of a faith that Jonathan had because he believed that God uh, was, uh, he believed that God was going to prevail. And I want to make several observations about three things that faith does. Going forward by faith, three things, or uh, three things I think we need to understand if we're going to go forward by faith. Looking at the story of Jonathan here, I think it's very simple. And and we all understand it always comes back to the simple but yet profound truths of God's word. 
First of all, I, I, I see this so clearly in this story, so clearly. Number one, faith does not focus on circumstances, but on Christ. Faith does not focus, focus on circumstances, but on Christ. See, now, Brother Barnes, this is Old Testament. And uh, we know this, my Bible says, Jonathan said, it may be that the who? The Lord will work for us. And New Testament believer, folks here at this church, can I say to you that faith does not focus on circumstances. Every one of us in this room have circumstances that if we focused on them would overwhelm us. Now you say, well, no, I'm, I'm doing all right now. <laughs> okay, well, praise the Lord for that. Because those times will come when the circumstances, the odds seemed impossible here. And if Jonathan was even going to get up to where he needed to get to, he was going to go, it says, a sharp, rock, a sharp rock to the left and to the right. And uh, boy, it was going to be a journey. It was going to be a challenge. But, but Jonathan didn't focus on the circumstances. Jonathan focused on Christ. And can I say to you that the greatest motivation, honestly, in my life is the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't say that uh, braggadociously. I, I say that to you, though, with confidence. My wife and I, we've, we've taught our boys. We've tried to teach them. And you've probably heard this many times. You've said this to your children, parents. But it, it's still true. Keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep your eyes on Jesus. You know, whenever I compare myself to somebody else, it affects my spirit. We do at least this much in New England when we nod. Sometimes somebody says amen, or whoopee. And that's revival right there. That's revival. Whoopee. And, uh, but uh, but y'all with me? Uh, the four years I passed in North Carolina, I, I, I developed the word y'all. It, it doesn't work in New England, but I'm, I'm trying to bring it. Y'all okay? Yeah. And, no, you're not okay. But, 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 but seriously, listen, keep your eyes on the Lord. Hey, listen, when you got saved, you put your eyes and you put your faith in Jesus Christ. To me, I look at things, I try to look at things like this in my life. If I can trust God with a salvation, with an eternity that I've never seen, I have no problem with trusting him with the things of this earth. Now, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but that works pretty good for me. But if it don't work for you, this much is true. You've got to keep your focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't focus on your circumstances. You know, some say, well, some say, well, yeah, you're just saying act like it's not there. I'm not saying act like it's not there at all. I'm, I'm saying don't just act like it. Believe your God is bigger. Believe your God's a lot bigger than your circumstances. And, and every one of us in this room very easily could be overwhelmed if we focused on our circumstances. But Jonathan said, I'm not going to do it. It's not happening. Big rock to the left, to the right. This is a challenge. All the Philistines. My dad, King Saul, is sitting under a pomegranate tree eating some grapes. They're sitting around talking about the old days. They didn't even have any old days, amen. They were just new in the saddle. They're trying to figure out what they're going to do. They're worried. What are we going to do? Jonathan said, listen, we're going to go after this thing. This is a term we use in New York. Ain't no thang but a chicken wang. <laughs> and uh, it's in the Bible. Look it up in the Hebrew. You'll find it later, all right? But listen, hey, listen. Hey, keep your eyes on the Lord. Don't focus on your circumstances. Jonathan said, hey, listen, we're going to go after this thing. And I'll tell you what will squelch your faith, my friend. You can be in church today and thank you for your faithfulness. We could be in church. We could wake up on Monday morning and all of a sudden the circumstances just seem like they're two times bigger than they were yesterday when we woke up. Focus on Christ. Focus on Christ. Keep your eyes on the Lord. That'll help your marriage. It'll help your child rearing. Help your service for the Lord. It'll help you and motivate you in all areas of your life. Don't focus on the circumstances. This is a typical, it's a story like any other in the Bible where the odds so many times seemed overwhelming, but, but not to God. To man, yes, but not to God. Don't focus on your circumstances. Focus on Christ. We're looking at the example of Jonathan. I would say to you, number two, don't focus on your limitations. And I think the two of those are a little similar, but I'll, I'll, I'll share with you where I get that from in verse 6 here in a moment. Don't focus on your limitations, but on the limitless one. <laughs> Same thing, on Christ. On your limitations. Say, what's the difference? Well, we have circumstances. We have our rock to the left and the right, the challenge to get up there, the challenge against who we're against. But sometimes we focus too much on what we don't have. Our limitations. Jonathan said this. Aren't you glad when you find it's in the Bible? Amen. This was good for me. I'm sorry you have to hear it because, no, I'm not sorry, but you know what I mean. 
but I needed this. I'm a church planter, boy. It's so easy for us to focus on our limitations, what we don't have. We're trying to find our next location. Our lease is up, and we had a unit below, above ours as well, and God's been good. God has been super good to us. But we're at a crossroads, and we're at decision-making time, and what are we going to do next? Where are we going to go next? Step of faith for us. We're all embarking on this journey, no matter where we're at. But Jonathan said this, For there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. We focus, we focus sometimes on our limitations. There's only a couple of us. A church planter struggles with that. Well, there's nobody here. We have a teen camp ministry that we're a part of in our church. And, um, and, and sometimes I'll hear pastors say, well, we don't have any teenagers in our church. And I, I don't, I'm not saying that to knock them at all. But, you know, I think to myself, I, I say to myself, I say, I believe they do. They, maybe it's somebody that's not faithful and that they're not ready yet for camp. But don't say I don't have any. You know, we word things sometimes, and I, uh, we joke about this in our home, and sometimes we say things like this, I'll never, we always, any y'all psychoanalytical like I am about that kind of stuff? Always, really? Never? Y'all still awake? All right. You don't want to laugh. Somebody's going to help you on the gut. <laughs> you know, don't, don't make anybody think that's like us too, you know. And, uh, but we make those statements sometimes because we think that way. It's impossible. I can't. I can't do this. Now, maybe you can't, but maybe we can change our thinking on that a little bit. But a lot of times what we do is because we focus on limitations. I can't, I can't, I can't. Did you forget that Philippians 4.13 was in the Bible? I can, I can, I can. And that's not an open-ended, I can do whatever I want because he's going to give me the strength to do so. I did a little series in our church about scriptures that if we're not careful are taking out of context. But you can do what God wants you to do and there's nothing impossible to God. Don't focus on your limitations. Don't focus on but, but, but. I can't, I can't, I can't. You don't understand my situation. Jonathan said, the Lord is not restrained. He's not restrained. The Lord is not restrained to save by many or few. He's not worried about a particular number. You know, man, and I'm not talking about it in attendance, right? but man focuses on a number. Look how many times God wanted to give victory by man realizing, no, no, I, I don't, you'll think that you did it. If, uh, let me just wean this down a little bit. Let me just break you so that you'll be reminded that what happens in your life, I'm the one that does it. That's God speaking, okay? Y'all understand? And listen, don't focus on your limitations. If you're going to go forward by faith, you have to focus on the limitless one. The same one you trusted in eternity with. The same one you said, wow, I mean, it's just not a get out of jail free card. It's eternal life. It's an eternity of peace and joy and happiness and, and awesomeness with our great God. And he wants to do great things here in and through us right now. He's not limited. We limit him if we lack faith. The book of Psalms speaks about that, doesn't it? Where there are times when we limit the Holy One of Israel, the Bible says. Don't focus on your limitations. Well, I, I just don't see how we can do it. You know, there's a lot of amazing military victories that were given because somebody said, everybody else says we can't, but we can do this thing. And can I just say to you, Christian, child of God, believer, it'd be tragic for somebody that is engaged in, and, and, and thank God for those that serve our country, that, ser that thank God for that. But I am, I am a firm believer. Listen, we are in the Lord's army. And it's a shame, it'd be a shame if somebody in the, the military realm or in the, the sports realm facing the giants, where everybody else to say it can't be done, it'd be, it's not right. Every believer ought to go forward by faith and say, listen, this may be impossible for me, but we're going to go after this thing. You know, a lot of times because we're afraid to fail. I, 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 I confess to that. What, what if we flop? What if it doesn't work? Jonathan didn't say that God, he said it may be that the Lord will work for us. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to suggest to you this evening that I believe Jonathan thought it was a good chance he was going to die. Y'all, st you still okay? You can shake your head no. I mean, I'll cry on my way out, but that's okay, you know. I really believe Jonathan really thought there was a good chance he was going to die. It may be the Lord will work for us. But Jonathan said, we're not going to know unless we go after it. Y'all with me? We're not, we're not going to know unless we go after it. 
We've got going forward by faith. Listen, here's what happens in the Christian life. Let me just, let me talk to us. Some of us have been saved a little while. What happens is after we've been saved for a little while, we start analyzing things and evaluating things based on what we think, stay with me now, church, what we think the outcome is going to be. Now, we want that outcome, but we can't let, the, let that determine the investment we're going to make in that. Y'all understand? We've been saved for a little while, so now we start, we start um, evaluating things a little differently. I'm, I'm not, I'm not um, promoting some kind of a, uh, a foolishness or whatever. Uh, I'm not offering you Kool-Aid after the service, okay? Uh, you understand, okay? But, but I will say to you, though, that, listen, we can't lose this awe that the journey as a believer is a continued journey of faith. You young adults, let me say this to you. You need to understand that. I'm not picking at you. You need to understand that. It is a journey of faith. You've got to exercise your faith. You've got to let God stretch your faith. God brings things into our lives but God's, because God's stretching our faith. And don't focus on the limitations. Faith doesn't focus on fame, but on, on being faithful. Just being faithful. Uh, I'm, I'm not stretching this. I, I don't think Jonathan said, I just want to be faithful. I think his faith just so, motivated him so much that he just said, I'm gonna, we're going to do this. Faith doesn't focus on fame. And listen, when God... I'm, <laughs> this is a humorous illustration. Again, I didn't even know the story, but... Uh, I didn't know one day I'd be able to tell the story of mailing a food stamp to Brother Henry O, you know. And, uh, you know, we don't do what we do for, to, to be recognized. We do what we do so that one day our sweet Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, will say what? Well done. One of the most, one of the greatest statements my dad ever made to me. My dad's still alive, lives in New York. We don't get to see each other very often, but... One of the greatest, one of the greatest moments in my life with my dad is when I went to Bible college and my dad hugged me and my dad said to me, son, I'm proud of you. I just bawled like a baby. You know, I mean, I just, I just lost it. To hear my dad say to me, son, I'm proud of you. To hear sweet Jesus say one day to you and to me, You did a good job. None of us were perfect. And we failed and we missed the mark sometimes. But how much we miss out on because we're not willing to go forward by faith. Because we get caught up in the, in the, um, the atmosphere of, of recognition. And, the atm and I, I know there's not a spirit of that here in this church. I, I totally understand that. But preachers, we face this challenge. Every bit of our fiber, we, we do. We want to be successful, as I said in the beginning of the message. In other words, because when our life is done, perhaps it'd be better for us to define success. And what that boils down to for a believer is success, according to the definition for us, was to was to, would be to just start and journey and finish by faith. And God, maybe God will bless that. Maybe somebody in a Sunday school class you taught 20 years ago. Maybe somebody you reached on a bus route or somebody you invited. Uh, wow, this is an amazing story. We just had our missions conference a couple weeks ago, and I got to see a young man who grew up in our church in New York. He's not a young man anymore. We grew up together. He's about five years younger than me. I hadn't seen him in 30 years. He's now the, the uh, director, one of the directors of BIMI, Mission uh, Board. And he is overseeing the project in Papua New Guinea. How many of you are familiar with the Bible project in Papua New Guinea? Any of you all familiar with that? Okay, a few of you are. God has opened a door in Papua New Guinea. It's an amazing story. I'll tell this quickly, and, and I'll give one more illustration, and then we'll be done. <clears throat> but God has opened the door in the country of Papua New Guinea. They, the, the, uh, I think it's the prime minister. I forget what his title is, but the leader of the country wants every single person in the public schools to get a Bible. And he wants them to get a King James Bible. Not only that, he wants, when he first, he got this from Fiji. This happened in Fiji about five or six years ago. He heard about it. Wouldn't this be a great thing if it happened in America, by the way? 
but he heard about it and he said not only that but I want somebody to go to every single one of the schools and I want you to tell them how to how to read it they were able to give them the gospel they're in this process right now they reached out to the Gideons the Gideons couldn't take the project BIM I did it, we're talking about millions of dollars they've done all the high schools now they're in the middle schools it'll cost millions of dollars they're making beautiful Bibles giving them to every single young person to public schools Brother Steve Maldoff works for BIM. He was a missionary in Australia for about 10 years. He is overseeing that project. A boy, listen to this carefully, a young man. I said, Brother Steve, have, you know, we had, I hadn't seen him in 30 years. We, we spent time together when we got there. We hugged. I said, man, it's so good to see you. I said, you look the same. He said, you don't. I said, that's not nice. And, uh, but I said, Brother Steve, I, gotta, I, I don't remember. How did your family get reached? He told me the story. He said his, his parents, his, their neighbors, invited their parents to the church's missions conference. Brother Steve's parents, Wolf and Eva Maldoff, his dad ended up, God called him to preach, he ended up pastoring in Ohio for about 15 years. Amazing story. But they got reached because they invited their neighbor to a missions conference. And all the stories that can be told one day, the stories we'll hear about in heaven of the people that were ministered to, and we didn't even know it, all because we were faithful. Not because we wanted to be recognized, not because we did it, for, but because we wanted to be faithful. Isn't this a great theme to encourage us to go forward during this Christmas holidays? To go forward by faith. Is God stretching your faith or is some circumstance in your life, some limitations that are in your life? Or some of us faced with the challenge of, of recognition or, or, I've used that word several times, that's not why I'm using that point, but... but um, and can I, I will say this to you, though. Those kind of sins need to be confessed to the Lord also. Y'all understand? When I become jealous, preacher, I have to ask God to forgive me because I fight that sin. When I become proud and I say, what about me? Or this or that. Because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And there's one thing every one of us in this room we can do. And so many in this church, people that are away, and I know your preacher will continue to lead you on this journey of going forward by faith. What an example of Jonathan in the Bible. you got to read the rest of the story. It's amazing. And here, here's what's awesome. When you go forward by faith, you and I get to see what only God can do. What only God can do. We can tell the stories, and your preacher, you can tell the stories of what you folks have seen God do in this church right here. I loved hearing him tell me about what God has done over the years in this church. Praise God for that. Somebody had to go forward by faith. Somebody had to give by faith. Somebody had to serve by faith. Somebody had to face some circumstances, some limitations, some, uh, some uh, impossible challenges and say, say to their wife, say to their husband, say to their children, say to their parents, listen, our whole world's being turned upside down, but one thing is for sure, we're going to go forward by faith. We're going after it. We're not going to, we are going after it. Jonathan, he went after it. And the Arbor said, wow, I'm with you, man. I'm with you. And God in his grace sends some people to serve with us and people that we still get to serve as we keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Forward by faith. Can I encourage you? Let's go forward by faith.